Okay, welcome back to long-term memory. There are many different types of long-term memory. The first division is to take long-term memory and to break it into two categories based on whether people are consciously aware of the memories or not. So you can see in this chart, the very top is long-term memory, and then it breaks down into explicit memory, which is your memories you're consciously aware of, and implicit memory, which is memories that you're not consciously aware of. So uh, sometimes they're called declarative. I can declare something that I'm consciously aware of. Declarative explicit memory means the same thing. These are memories of things that I know. I know the date I was married. I know my name is Maggie. I know I live in the San Fernando Valley. These are bits of knowledge that I'm aware of knowing. Uh, but I also have non-declarative, things I can't tell you, uh, implicit memories. Um, for example, um, I really hate snakes. I just, ugh. I don't know why. I have no memory of why I would feel particularly negative about snakes. Spiders don't bother me. Bugs are fine. Why snakes? Frogs are fine. Love lizards. I don't know. Implicit. Implicit memory. Um, Athletes have a really hard time talking about how they do what they do. If you had to explain to someone, not with pictures or not by demonstrating how to ride a bicycle, but by actually saying all the words of all the steps involved in riding a bicycle, it'd be hard, right? I, what do I know about riding? I know a lot about riding bicycles, but how would I describe it to someone else? Well, you sit on the seat, you hang onto the handles, you push the pedals, okay. But then how do you keep your balance? I, I, <laughs> implicit, implicit knowledge. Okay, so we know the difference between explicit and implicit long-term memory. Now I wanna give you one other little insight before we talk about one of the most famous cases of amnesia ever. What's that other ep uh, insight? I want you to know what epilepsy is, epilepsy. It's fairly common and affects two, 3% of the population. Epilepsy is, um, actually it's an umbrella term for a lot of different conditions, but it is said to occur when for a brief period of time, there's essentially a storm, a firestorm of activity in your brain. Um, you can see in this drawing, you know, each little line is the output from one EEG sensor that's measuring the electrical activity on the surface of the brain. And you know, the activity is going along fine. And then all of a sudden, boom, all the sensors are picking up this crazy storm of activity. When that happens, when that sort of um, storm of activity occurs in someone's brain, can have many different effects. Some people seem to um, lose their awareness of the world for a while, a few seconds maybe. Other people have seizures and might fall to the ground and have muscle convulsions. Um, if either way, if you were driving or walking across the street when you had an epileptic seizure, um, that would be very bad, right? So there's a lot of research on controlling epilepsy. In the early days, that research was, uh, I think the polite word is pretty primitive. Um, what scientists did was essentially find people who were suffering from epilepsy or other types of brain disorders and cut out big chunks of their brains. Um, and that's what happened to this fellow. So he was known for decades as patient HM. And as my students know, when someone's still alive, you refer to them by their initials to protect their anonymity. Um, but HM died in 2008. And then we discovered his name uh, was Henry Mollison. But many of us are so used to calling him patient HM that I'll probably refer to him that way. Patient HM had his hippocampus and other neural tissue from each temporal lobe removed by a doctor who was attempting to control his epilepsy. And the good news is that the surgery significantly reduced his epileptic seizures. So that's great. The bad news was he also suffered from 
amnesia, and a particular kind of amnesia, anterior grade amnesia. He had it severely. What is anterior grade amnesia? Anterior grade amnesia is the inability to form new memories after the surgery. So patient HM could remember his life very well from before the surgery. He was kind of stuck there memory-wise. What happened during his 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s? No memory. Henry Mollison could not form new memories from his life after his surgery. You might think, well, maybe that's not so bad. Imagine remembering yourself as a 20-year-old and every morning you get up and you look in the mirror and a 60-year-old version of yourself is looking back from the mirror. Wow, okay? That would be pretty traumatic. But there were other aspects of patient HM's life that were pretty limiting. He couldn't go out and get a job, for example, because he couldn't remember that he had a new job. Um, for example, uh, if you put lunch in front of patient HM, he would eat the lunch and you could take the tray away and wait, I don't know, 15 minutes because his short-term memory was fine. It was just his long-term memory. You put another tray of lunch in front of HM and he would eat that lunch. You take it away, wait a few minutes, put another lunch in front of him. He'd keep eating because he couldn't remember that he had just eaten lunch. I mean, eventually his stomach would fill full, but you can eat a long time before you feel full. Um, another example is that patient HM liked to uh, stay at home and watch new movies. He could watch the same movie over and over and over and over and over again because he had no memory of having seen the movie if the first time he saw the movie was after his surgery. For those of you who are Drew Barrymore fans, uh, the movie, um, uh, what is it, 50 First Dates is the same idea. It's anterior grade amnesia. In that movie, Drew Barrymore could not create new memories. So Henry Mollison could remember his memories from before surgery. He could remember events from his life from before surgery, but not his memories. Could not remember aspects of his life that occurred after surgery. Except there's an interesting com complication. It turns out that what patient HM could not remember, what he could not form is new explicit memories. He could form new implicit memories, but implicit means you know, you're not consciously aware of it. So he didn't know he had formed these new memories, but he still could. And how do we know that? Well, people taught him various things, like how to draw a line by looking in a mirror, not looking at where you're drawing, but looking at a mirror reflection of where you're drawing. Anybody who's tried to look in a mirror and, I don't know, put on an earring or deal with a particular piece of hair, you know, you've got to move backwards from the direction that you're seeing. It's hard and it takes a while to learn that. So researchers would come to his home a few times a week for decades. Every time they came to his home, they'd have to introduce themselves because he could never remember that they had been there a hundred times before. And he would, they would set a task in front of him, like this mirror, drawing in a mirror task. Or another one was the Tower of Hanoi, which is a simple game, um, but has complex motor aspects to it. Uh, and every time Henry Molson would look at this toy or game and say he had never seen it before in his life, as he's solving the game. So his performance, for example, you can see in the graph down here, his performance in the sort of backwards or mirror image drawing task would get better and better and better, but he had no memory of ever learning how to draw in a, uh, from a mirror. Uh, he had no memory of ever learning how to solve the Tower of Hanoi puzzle, but he would solve it more quickly each time. So there's an example of the separation of implicit and explicit memory because patient HM could form new implicit memories, but he could not form new explicit memories. 
Okay. I want to talk to you a little bit about consolidation. How does information get from short-term memory to long-term memory? Well, it turns out the hippocampus plays a really big role in getting information from short-term memory into long-term memory. And that process we call consolidation. Imagine it's like pouring concrete and when the, when the concrete becomes solid, that's when your long-term memory is really in there. Um, so we know that your brain creates physical representations that correspond to your memories. And that knowledge comes from short-term memory and goes into long-term memory via the process of consolidation. Now, what do we know about the process of consolidation? Well, we know that getting hit in the head disrupts consolidation. And how do we know that? Well, if you're in a car accident and you hit your head, you probably are not going to remember the accident. If you talk to someone who's been in a car accident where they've had a concussion, what they'll tell you is something along the lines of, I remember getting in the car, I remember starting the car, I remember getting on the 405, and the next thing I know, I'm in the hospital. Okay, so they're suffering from a kind of amnesia, right? Some of it's from before the accident, and some of it is from after the accident. So both retrograde and anterior grade amnesia. Okay. This consolidation, getting information from short-term memory to long-term memory. We know it's, it's disrupted by head injuries, by concussions. We also know from patient HM that it requires the hippocampus. The hippocampus plays a fundamentally important role in the conversion of short-term memories into long-term memories. Okay? Now, when does the hippocampus do this translation from short-term memory into long-term memory? When you sleep. That's when consolidation happens. When you sleep. And how do we know this? Neurons in the hippocampus and in other cortical areas fire in similar patterns similar spatial and temporal patterns when you learn something and during REM sleep the night after you learn that thing. Okay, so you're, as far as we understand, your brain is taking information that you learned during the day and consolidating it, wiring it into your brain while you sleep, which is why I'm always um, nagging, I guess is the word, nagging students not to stay up all night, but to study and then sleep, study and then sleep. Take advantage of how consolidation works. If you don't get enough sleep, and some people would argue REM sleep, so and REM sleep is the kind of sleep that you get more and more of the longer you sleep. So someone who gets uh, eight hours sleep gets much more than double the REM sleep of someone who only got four hours of sleep because the, the percentage of REM sleep increases as the number of hours that you sleep continues. Without sleep, you're not going to consolidate information into long-term memory. Okay, is the information, is, is the hippocampus where long-term memories are stored? No, that's not how it works. We know that the hippocampus is very important from consolidating taking short-term memory information and moving it into long-term memory, but it's the consolidation process. Now, it turns out there is a category of long-term memories that do live in the hippocampus. We haven't talked about them yet. Um, they're hippocampal place cells, and they're um, very good at remembering spatial locations. Um, but other types of memory live in essentially the most relevant or related part of the cortex. So for example, visual memories are going to involve my visual cortex. Um, memories for music are going to involve my temporal lobes. Um, the cerebellum is going to be the site of where I store my motor memories. The amygdala, which we know is very important for emotions, that's where I'm going to store my emotional memories. So. Um, Long-term memories are stored all over the brain, but the process of getting information from short-term memory into long-term memory, that is what you need your hippocampus for. So remember I said 
This is just to tie it up. Remember I said that similar brain areas are active when you learn something and when consolidation occurs while you're sleeping? Uh, this slide gives you a sense of the overlap between um, where knowledge is experienced and processed and where it's stored. So if you uh, look at the left-hand side of this um, set of brain images, and you look at the top, upper top corner, you can see the activity that occurs when a subject sees pictures. And just below that, you can see the activity in the temporal lobes when a subject hears sounds. Now, what happens when somebody recalls those memories? Well, look at that. Similar brain areas involved in the perception of pictures are also active during recall of those pictures. The brain areas involved in uh, your memory for sounds are the same brain areas that were involved in your analysis, your perception of sounds. So there's a tight coupling there. Come right back and we will talk about semantic memory in a way that might get some people hot and bothered, which will be fun. Take care.